So it's just seven o'clock now. We're here at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am Catherine Schaefer with Child Ready Web Talk, and we are going to be in for a treat this evening. Uh, we want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day to join us, and we appreciate all that you do for our uh, communities abroad, our EMS uh, services. We appreciate all you do uh, every day of the year. Um, as I'm trying to flip through this PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> I'm going to take it out. It's uh, always a work in progress sometimes over here. It's not letting me click through these slides, so I think we're still in a PowerPoint mode over with another laptop. Uh, but we'll keep going as we work out our little bumps and glitches. So right now, uh, you are listening to Child Ready Web Talk, and we are with the New Mexico Child Ready Program and New Mexico EMS for Children Program. We are federally funded. We've been in New Mexico and around the state for 22 years. You might know somebody by the name of Robert Sapien. He is our principal investigator and the, the champion of our cause. Um, we are doing this quarterly. So we try and recruit people in uh, on a regular basis that are just stellar service providers and educators in our state. And um, we are lucky enough to have Jim Alday here with us this evening. And co-hosting is going to be Scott Oglesby. Um, we um, are available on the Zoom for questions. And as soon as I figure out how to get through the slideshow, oh, there we go, thank you. Joan had to come help me because I am non-caffeinated today. Uh, my name is Katherine Schaefer. Again, I'm the program manager for, this, uh, for the New Mexico EMS and Child Ready programs. We also have uh, Joan Caldwell, who is uh, our web designer. As I say there, she is extraordinaire, web designer extraordinaire. She is also many years in the pediatric ER as a fabulous clinician. Um, we have Laura Grijalva, who is an EMT paramedic, and she is in our ER and works for us and helps us uh, put on these programs. And we also have Himansu, who is our graduate assistant, and he is just fabulous. And he will take our um, programs and put them online for you in just a few weeks uh, with Joan's help. So let's get to the topic um, and let's talk a little bit, Jim. Um, I've actually known you for quite some time here at the university. I know of you. I've met you a couple times before, and I. I You've been with Lifeguard as long as I've been here, but tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from. So I um, <clears throat> started my EMS career in uh, 77 uh, as an EMT, uh, started uh, working in a little town about 45 miles southeast of Austin, Texas. Um, and then after about a year there, got hired on to Austin Travis County EMS, uh, became a paramedic in 79. Uh, and uh, started uh, flying uh, for Austin Travis County EMS in their flight program in 84. Uh, it actually went live in 85, we were training in 84. And then um, at some point decided I, I wanted to know more and so I chose to go to a nursing school. Uh, I already had a bachelor's in zoology so I had the bulk of the work done, uh, all the chemistry and biology, et cetera. And then uh, became a nurse in 92 uh, worked in the ER and flew at the same time for a long time and then finally flying just really took over my life And so I couldn't do two jobs at once anymore um, So did that uh, came to uh, Lifeguard in uh, July of 2011 uh, and have been here since We uh, at that point in time. We were only flying uh, planes or about the last two and a half years ago uh, We brought back the helicopter. So we've been doing that and doing about the last year and a half We've also then integrated the uh, neonatal transports with the lifeguard program. Wow. And so we have some select uh, clinicians and caregivers who, uh, who specifically transport the neonates. Uh, right now they're only transporting up to 28 months or 28 days old, and, uh, but they will be progressing into becoming a specialized PD team and start actually transporting the older kids also. In the meantime, the regular lifeguard crew transports all patients, all ages. Diaper to diaper. Diaper to diaper, gosh, I like that. So tell me a little bit about um, your topic this evening. All right, so do uh, you wanna switch that? We'll oh. go to the next one. Yep. So the, some of the uh, objectives we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about injury patterns and, and trauma with kiddos, 
some of the anatomic and physiologic difference between kids and, and adults that you've got to pay attention to. Talked a little bit about growth and development and kind of psychosocial implications. Uh, transport or uh, treatment uh, of the pediatric patient and some of the differences in adult and pediatric uh, management. You know, one of the things about taking care of kiddos is that uh, typically there's an adult somewhere around or a relative, and so you end up having to somewhat take care of them also, and also be thinking about, is there a way that I can transport that adult with me uh, so that, because sometimes that'll be comfort for the kid if the kid's alert enough to realize their parent is there. Uh, or certainly when we get to the receiving hospital, to assist with any further information about the kiddo and then uh, uh, permission signing for procedures and stuff that may be necessary. That's always helpful. And I just want to take one moment here. And um, Scott Oglesby is joining us. And Scott is with both programs. Um, child, uh, I'm sorry, he's not. He's actually with PCARN. And PCARN is our research component, but he has um, many years of field work in EMS and has a heart, heart of a child, brain of a child. Just a heart of a child. <laughs> heart of a child for any of a grown up. You know, so I've done uh, everything in EMS from ski patrol to uh, ground critical care paramedicine. And I think it's a real treat tonight to be able to, to speak with Jim about um, transport considerations of pediatrics and the air environment, something I've, I've never really done. So, um, so welcome. Oh, and thanks. demographically, we have many of our hospitals who are, you know, hundreds of miles away from UNMH, which is the only level one trauma center. So this is their only route out is via air transport. So this is really critical to our state. But not to digress from your lecture, I think it's uh -huh. really fascinating how you mentioned that you need to consider the weight of the parents um, and any other passengers when you're, you're flying. So. Right, yeah, flying, it's all about uh, space and weight. Uh, and uh, here in uh, New Mexico, since we started 5,000 feet already, the air is already thinner, and the thicker the air, if you will, the easier it is to get lift, whether you're flying a plane or a helicopter. And, um, and so you really have to be paying attention to um, how much, and when there's heat, heat also then causes the air to rise, and as the air rises, then what's left underneath, if you will, is lighter or thinner. And so hot days in New Mexico uh, at altitude uh, can be problematic sometimes, more for helicopters than it is for fixed wings. And, some, and sometimes the helicopters just aren't uh, large enough to accommodate the, uh, the medical crew, the patient, the pilot, and then a uh, parent. Uh, sometimes if we have that information on the front end from an, from a, uh, another, an outlying facility, then, and they may specifically even request, can you have the plane come versus the helicopter? Even though the helicopter might be quicker because it goes from pad to pad, whereas the plane has to land at an airport, and then there's always the ground transport leg in between. Uh, but if, if, the, if, the, if the child, while maybe being critical, maybe there's not a time sensitive need, then it may be better to uh, take the slightly longer time by the fixed wing, if that's the case, when you can then also bring the parent with you. Wow, so. thank you. All right, so pediatric trauma, leading cause of death for kids one to 17 years of age. And we have the leading causes of, of death here, motor vehicle collisions, drowning, child maltreatment, homicide, SAD, that's number three. Burns, suicide is even up there. Uh, and of the non-fatal injuries, falls tend to be the, uh, the number one uh, problem. So big thing on motor vehicle collisions is improper restraint is the number one risk factor for injury or death. Uh, there have been times where you, know, you show up on the scene taking care of this kiddo and they're perfectly secure to their child seat and the child seat has been thrown out of the car because it was the seat itself was never secured to the vehicle, sadly. Uh, or you have kiddos who have been injured by the airbags because they were sitting face forward in the front seat, uh, passenger seat, as opposed to rearward in the back seat. Uh, some common injury patterns uh, for kiddos. Um, it's, it's rare to have uh, cervical spinal injuries uh, in the very young kids because their bones are still fairly ca uh, cartilaginous and uh, but there is enough movement where you can actually stretch or impinge upon a spinal cord and have an injury there but then if you take an x-ray of that or a CT of that you actually don't see a physical injury because it's an injury to the cord itself not to the bones that not to your vertebra and we'll talk about that uh, uh, briefly a little bit later. Um, 
Other things that you may see in the two and five year olds in a motor vehicle collisions is that if they're improperly secured in their seat and all they have is a lap belt, uh, and let's say you had a significant uh, head-on collision, then the child folds over significantly to the point where uh, they may also then have abdominal injuries and with folding over so significantly, they may have also injured one of their lumbar spine because it's maybe it's been crushed in or a wedge shaped type of a fracture. And then certainly head injuries. With respect to firearm injuries, these are a variety of reasons why there may be a firearm injury. Maybe it's family violence. Maybe there's depression of the teenager. Uh, and they've decided that life's not worth living, and so this is their plan. And the parents, sadly, haven't secured firearms in their house appropriately, like in a gun safe. Uh, and, uh, and or there's drug or alcohol use in the house, and that could be the teenager who's using that, and so it's affected their mentation, or that could be the parents that are around them, and that's affected their mentation. Or sometimes it's not the parents uh, because maybe uh, the mom is no longer married to the biological father, and so she has her boyfriend, and the boyfriend doesn't have the connection to the kiddo, especially the young kiddo, because a lot of times the, um, the uh, injuries to kiddos uh, tends to occur to kids that are less than four years of age. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but in, in, it's not uncommon that sometimes that is done by the non-custodial parent, as it were. And then even bullying, uh, you know, bullying in schools nowadays, a big thing, you know, it's, it's on social media, kids get bullied. And so again, that may cause them to become depressed, to become suicidal, or it may be the kid who's tired of being picked on, chooses to then take it out on the bully uh, with a gun that they've gotten uh, their hands on. You know, Jim, bullying is, is, is such a risk factor and seeing its prominence related to firearm injuries. Do you think this is something we should start screening for and relaying to the, the emergency department physician, the receiving physician? Yeah. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Is You know, I, I don't know so sure with respect to like these and, and then selecting these. I think they more, it, it's not necessarily screening for bullying, but it's maybe just having an appreciation for what were the circumstances around how this child got injured. Uh, and it may be something that then the the law enforcement agency who's following up on this may be discovering this, whether it was in school or at home or among peers or something. Um, but, but I think it, it, it's nice to see more in the last few years that bullying has, bullying has finally risen high enough that people are finally paying attention to it and realizing that it's not just a, an e, a, a simple thing or something that will um, wear out, as, as it were, or, or disappear over time as the children grow up. So under the child uh, maltreatment, as I was alluding to, uh, at least more, hundred, more than 675,000 cases are reported annually in the United States. Uh, you know, the thing to pay attention to, to have a high index of suspicion is that the, uh, if the kid is, is able to tell you, maybe their report is not consistent with what the parents, and, or the parent's stories changes slightly every time you ask them what happened or the, the parent's story, or not the parent, just whoever is around the kid who did this, uh, their story doesn't match the injuries to the kid. Um, so the, the, the theme is that you, know, you document, you document, you document what was said, you document what you found, uh, and then we as EMS providers, we're obligated to report. And reporting is not simply telling that to the receiving doctor or nurse, reporting that is reporting it to the appropriate authority whether that's law enforcement or in, in New Mexico, CYFD. Uh, and even if, you, even if the receiving nurse or doctor says, oh, I will contact them, it's like, no, you need to do that yourself. And, and so better to have multiple reports you know, from the EMS, from the nurse, from the doctor, from the, from the consulting physician, and they got four reports on that one kid, than no one report because each one thinks somebody else is gonna do the report. And so this is just some examples of, uh, you know, it's one thing to spank your kid. This kid in the, in the left picture clearly has been beat. Uh, this kiddo over here and, and the other one is showing a stall burn where uh, this child was held down into hot water, probably in a bathtub, uh, to the point where it stalled it. But they didn't force them all the way in, but uh, because they're sparing, then obviously above where the water wasn't. 
Uh, and it's not uncommon that sometimes if they do force the kid fully in, onto the bathroom, uh, onto the bathtub bottom, that right around the uh, anus will be spared because that will have been pressed against the bottom of the bathtub and the hot water did not get to that piece. And that's another clue that you see, oh, this is not simply, they were in the bathtub, mom turned on the hot water, the doorbell rang, mom left quickly to go in there because that would be a whole different injury pattern. And let me just interject one thing. So mm -hmm. for EMS on scene, um, less likely to make assumptions about child abuse because they don't have the confidence level but I wanted, there was a resource from the uh, University of Colorado that I want to make people aware of. It's um, called identifychildabuse.org. It's all one yeah. word, and it's to help um, providers uh, better be able to find key, those key things that you were talking about, those clues. And so you go through uh, about 135 modules fairly rapidly. And as you identify the patterns, it'll tell you you're right, you're wrong. And as you go through them, you improve. So by the end of that, you can hmm. see how much you've improved. But it's really a great resource. It's free of charge. Identifychildabuse.org. Wow, that's very cool. Uh, just another thing about this, it's not restricted to any social, economic, racial, or cultural segment of society. It occurs across all of those. Some things it is associated with is if there's a child who has a physical or cognitive deficit, that sometimes the people around them will be frustrated by that and will take it out on the child. Uh, poor parenting skills, uh, some sort of marital conflict, lack of a social uh, support system. Uh, and, you know, again, having that high intensity of suspicion, but focus your attention on the child. Take care of the child. Let go of the fact that maybe the offender is in the room with you, or maybe even riding with you in the back of your ambulance or in your helicopter or in your plane. Appreciate that while you're there, they're not going to be doing anything during that transport. And, and one thing that might really help the law enforcement agency that you brought them with them, because as they're seeing this and then interviewing, you've potentially brought the perpetrator there and it's a lot easier for them than them having to drive however the heck far away, this may have actually occurred. So drownings, you get a bimodal age distribution. So you get the first peak in kids under age of five because they don't know how to swim or they, they're toddlers and they got that big head and they look over in a bucket of water or something and as they're looking over, the head's too heavy, they fall into it and they don't have the strength to lift their head out of that bucket of water. Whether it's a mop bucket or, or it could be a bathtub or something. Uh, and and uh, so that's your first group of people. And then the other is adolescent males, age 15 to 24, because they're out there doing something reckless. Like, hey, I bet you can't swim from here to the other side of the lake or to that island that's out there. And so, and or at that age, they're also, you know, alcohol may be involved. And so uh, uh, there's that problem also at, at that particular uh, issue. Um, you might consider an intentional injury, uh, you know, that, that again, it might be the adult who's taking it out on the kid and they've actually drowned the kid. Uh, it's not uncommon that's associated with a traumatic injury, especially if it's a diving type thing where you, you get the spinal cord injury or the head injury. Um, but, but, and, and the thing is, drowning is a fairly silent thing because uh, when the kid is out there and the kid gets overwhelmed, they go, um, you know, they just go under and it's not necessarily like they're screaming. Um, so um, the thing to pay attention to, I think, that really might help prevent some drownings is that at family events and picnics and stuff, because, you know, the kids are all out there in the water, in the pool or in the lake. And then it's not until somebody says, hey, it's dinner time. And then everybody comes and goes, hey, where's little Jimmy? And then they go back out there and they see little Jimmy's in the bottom of the pool, or little Jimmy's floating. And so maybe if you had a little sign that hung around the neck of an adult who's not drinking, and it says, you know, like child watcher, and then after 30 minutes, you hand it off to another adult, and then another 30 minutes, another adult. And so that way, no one adult is responsible for watching all the kids for the whole time, and that way the party's not that much fun for that adult. But they are, every 30 minutes, it's an adult, and their sole job is to watch the kids. So that might be a way to prevent some uh, drownings. Even if resuscitation occurs, you get the kid back, you know, maybe it was just a respiratory arrest, and they came back, you still want to transport that kid to the hospital to be further evaluated. Because if, if there was some hypoxic event for a short time, that can cause especially the cells in the lungs, who are very sensitive to hypoxic events, to be a little more loose, if you will, 
And so then fluid can leak into, over time, can leak into those alveoli, and then you can have some issues after that, uh, some respiratory issues, pneumonias, whatever, that still need to be evaluated. You know, Jim, speaking of, of fluids and, um, and osmolarity, I was talking with a physician friend recently who said that there's um, uh, really no difference in freshwater versus saltwater drownings. And let me know if, 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 if she's wrong, because as a paramedic during my uh, training, we were told that saltwater drownings, because of the high salt content, had a worse outcome. But apparently, I was mistaken. Yeah, yes, I was taught the same thing. And then over time, the, the realization is that um, people tend to, so you, you get some water, regardless of whether it's, you know, dirty water or clear water or salt water into that larynx, and immediately your esophagus is going to clamp shut. So it's not like you're going to get a ton of fluid into your lungs. And then only as you lose consciousness and that, that re reflex, if you will, just gradually loosens up, then you might get some water that pours into the lungs, I say pour, trickles into the lungs, but it's not so much that it really makes a difference uh, in your treatment of that particular patient. So a drowning to drowning is a drowning. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, okay. Survival factors, immediate high quality CPR, single most important factor. You know, so, you know, pools where there's, or, or lakes where or there's a swim area around a lake that's, that's encased, and if there's a lifeguard there that's watching all the kids, to, to make sure that you do have someone at least there who can rescue them and do good quality CPR. That's what's going to save the kiddo. So where are we going to take these trauma kids? Ideally, a pediatric trauma center. However, there are very few of those in the country who actually are designated as that. Because if you will, that's basically a level one pediatric trauma center. In New Mexico, what we, the, this state only has one level one trauma center with pediatric qualifications, and that's UNMH. So severely injured kid needs to be coming here, uh, which, which means, as you mentioned earlier, that New Mexico is a very rural state. So they may initially go to a local trauma center, level three or level four, because there are no level twos in this state, uh, and get some initial resuscitation, and then depending upon the distance, then may have to uh, fly the kid out either by a plane or a helicopter. You know, and ideally, you would be doing that with a transport team that also has good pediatric training. So some differences, now we're getting into a little anatomic and uh, physiologic differences between the uh, adults and kiddos. So the airway differences, basically, you know, the kid's got the big tongue, the kid's uh, airway is more anterior, uh, the kid's airway is more conical in shape uh, versus the adult is more cylindrical, and in the adult, the narrowest part is at the vocal cords, whereas in the kiddo, the narrowest part is at the cricoid uh, ring. Uh, and, uh, and certainly a, a much, the epiglottis itself is going to be floppier, the tongue's bigger and floppier, and so it makes it a little bit harder to get a good view as you're trying, if you were doing, if you had the special skills and you were doing the uh, pediatric intubation to be able to get the view that you, that is sometimes a little more easier to get in an adult uh, than in the peds. Uh, other differences, smaller body mass. So a blow from my fist to your stomach is going to be only really impact that area on your abdomen that encompasses the size of my fist. If I do that to this baby size, I've, I've potentially injured every organ uh, in that kiddo's uh, abdomen because their body surface area is so much smaller. Uh, also, because their body surface area is, is uh, it's, it's smaller, but with respect to the uh, body of the kid, uh, they will lose heat a lot quicker, and, and um, they are basically just bags of water. Oh, yeah. So they will also dehydrate a lot quicker than an adult would. And so if, if a child becomes hypothermic, they become acidotic, they become refractory to your resuscitation. And so if you're wondering, why is this kid not responding the way we want to, feel the kid. And if the kid is cold, that may be part of the reason. Drugs aren't working, fluids aren't working, they're acidotic. Uh, doesn't matter what you're doing airway-wise, they're staying metabolically acidotic. And so it's really, really important that you maintain normal thermia for uh, pediatric transport patients. Jim, what do you do in the, the, the air transport environment to keep kids warm? I know in the back of the ambulance, the old adage was to crank up the heat, which would certainly work. Right. Warm packs, lots of blankets. 
What do you have at your disposal? It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, I will say in the uh, helicopter and the planes, it's fairly easy to get it uh, hot because the uh, heat in airplanes and helicopters comes straight off the engine heat. It's not from a heater, uh, and so it can get really hot uh, fairly quick. Uh, as we get down to little big babies this size, we put them in an isolate. So now the space that I have to heat them, keep them warm in is a lot smaller. It's not the entire compartment of my ambulance or helicopter. It's just that space. And then that also has a heater that heats up the, the mat that the baby is on and then the air in there. Uh, we also do carry large uh, heat packs that are designed for infants that will only uh, heat up to 104 degrees. And so there's no way to actually burn the child. Like uh, if, you, if you use the heat pack that you got from REI or any other backpacking place, those aren't typically designed with a limit. And so those you could potentially uh, burn a kid out. Okay. Especially the young ones using uh, improper heat packs because their skin is so thin, and so it's really easy to have a second or third degree burn. Good question. So more, more differences, musculoskeletal. Incomplete calcification, very pliable. If you have a, a young child, you know, four, five, six-year-old, and they have a broken leg or a broken arm, you need to be concerned with, okay, how much force did it really cause to break that? Uh, because, because since their bones are more pliable, you really have to put a lot of force on them to uh, break that bone. Same thing with the ribs. Ribs are bones. You can have a lot of underlying uh, lung damage, heart damage, um, from uh, some sort of uh, blow to the chest or, uh, you know, the, the, the kid was thrown out of a car, hit a rock or something, and you feel the chest and the chest feels intact, but underneath, because it is so pliable, the injury to the, uh, to the lungs and the, and the heart could be pretty significant. Um, so in, in this particular uh, x-ray, what it's also showing is that in kiddos, they have active growth plates. And so if there's uh, damage to a bone at the growth plate, it's not uncommon then as that heals, that particular bone will not continue to grow at the same length as the matching bone on the other side of the body. And so in this particular case with this child with this uh, femur fracture here, this distal femur fracture at the growth plate, there's potential that this kid, that leg may be a little bit shorter overall as this kid uh, develops. Developmental considerations. Think about what's the baseline developmental level. Uh, appreciate that uh, kids and sometimes even adults will regress to a younger age. So they may be acting as if they're a two-year-old and yet you're really taking care of a four or five or a six-year-old. And so they're not quite, and you're thinking, wait, wow, is this a, a development delayed kid? Uh, you know, and the parents say, oh no, you know, they, they're writing, they're talking, they know, they know some basic math and stuff. And it's like, wow, this child just doesn't seem to be that. Just appreciate that that may be nothing but this kid has regressed because of the amount of stress that's going on, whether they just saw somebody get stabbed or shot or a bad car wreck or a house fire or whatever it is, it doesn't have anything to do necessarily that they have an injury to their head and that's why they seem to be not functioning appropriately. Know the key milestones, i.e. if you get a, somebody that says, oh, I don't know what happened to the child, they were in the crib, I inadvertently left the side of the crib down and they rolled, they must have rolled over and hit the hard floor and this is a two month old. Sorry, two month old cannot do that. You, you can, two month old cannot start lifting itself up and or moving its leg to kick itself over from stomach to back until at least usually about four months of age, if not a little bit older. So you have to also, so if you know some of these things, then you have a better idea of also what truly could have happened or not have happened. And you also have a better idea of how to talk to a kid. You know, when a child's really young, they don't have permanence. And so if you hide a ball behind your back, as far as they know, that ball is no longer on the planet. And you bring it back out, wow, it's a magic act for the kid. Uh, and, and so, you know, spend a little bit of time out there and watch, you know, watch, uh, net, not Netflix, but watch uh, some, of the, some of the children's TV shows and stuff. So you can also have a sense of, okay, what age probably watches this show? So how can I communicate with this child to get their uh, trust in me and then I can talk to them? Uh, so you might want to, you know, spend some time on Saturday mornings or whatever and watch some of the kiddo shows or something. Uh, go see some of the Disney movies or whatever, uh, and, uh, and you'll just be able to communicate with your patients a lot better. And certainly then you may have development delayed children, and, and again, if you have parents available that can help you 
then you can have a better idea of why isn't this kid communicating with me? They're a six-year-old and yet they seem to be acting like a three-year-old and it's not because they're regressed during this, it's because they actually are delayed. Psychosocial issues. You know, one of the big things in taking care of kiddos, unlike adult patients, is that you also have parents or caregivers. Uh, and we don't get, in EMS, I don't believe we have a lot of exposure in our training and education on taking care of kids. And then when you talk, match that with the fact that the times that we run on kids is not that much, and the times that we run on really critically injured kids is even smaller, that we don't have a lot of experience to, um, to look back on or to have in, in our ex experience to help us figure out, okay, is this normal? Is this a variant of normal or is this truly abnormal? with how this kid is presented uh, and what I need to do. Uh, and, uh, and you're gonna have those parents right there. Now, I, I would recommend, you know, use the parents. You know, I've done CPR on kids and I've had parents hold the IV bag for me. I've had parents hold the kid's hand for me. I've had kids whisper sweet nothings into the kid's ear for me. Uh, I've, had kid, I've had parents hold pressure on a wound for me while I was dealing with another wound or something else. And so, and I think, while you may think, ooh, I don't want the parents to do that, actually it gives them a job to do. Uh, and, and they're seeing also what you're doing for them. So while those parents are there, they're seeing how much you care for their child and how much you're doing to try to help that child. Uh, let's see, what else? All right, that's it for that one. So since we, don't, since we know that we don't run a lot of calls on kiddos, and especially very critical kiddos, use whatever you can to unload the cognitive load. So you're not having to calculate everything in your head. Use the Braslow tape or some other weight-based measurement tape that gives you an idea of a kid who's this long, probably weighs this much, and here are the size themes that I might need to use to use on this child, whether it's an IV size or an ET tube or an, or an LMA or a King airway or an eye gel, excuse me. And then frequently also in, in those calculations, then there's also what are some of the common medications I may need to, may need to give this kid, and it's right there. The, the amount is right there for you to draw up and to give to them. Or you may have an app on your phone that you use. Uh, we do that a lot uh, at uh, Lifeguard. On our way out, flying out, if we know the weight of the kid, then we start calculating based upon what we know about the kid. Well, if we're gonna get there and they're gonna have this problem, then we're probably gonna give this amount of this medication, or we're gonna probably have this size of this piece of equipment. So we already have that. Uh, in her head, and we may choose to go ahead and draw up those, and so we have some multiple doses uh, for the uh, for the uh, child. Because in children, unlike adults, you can kind of get away in adults with oh, give them the whole vial or give them the whole syringe worth. In a kiddo, if you catch yourself giving a kid a whole vial, or especially if you're calculating how much medication you need to give, and you're starting to draw up out of a second vial, rethink that because you've got a decimal point probably in the wrong place. So airway, so that's kind of doing that. So now we're gonna be looking at more specific things that A, B, C, D, E that we do on every patient. So airway, doing your typical assessment that you normally do on, is this a good airway, is this a not a good airway? Uh, is, this, is this a protected airway or not a protected airway? Is this kid starting to fatigue out breathing wise and they're gonna lose their ability to protect their airway and so I need to take care of their airway. So be thinking about, What's the position that the kid is in? Do I need to be suctioning? What are my adjuncts? Uh, nasal pharyngeal airway, uh, an oral airway, uh, C-spine stabilization, you know, and appreciate that um, in little bitty kiddos, little infants, uh, up to, I don't know, maybe four to six months of age or so, um, they're gonna be obligate nose breathers. And that means they, as far as they know, they breathe through their nose and they eat through their mouth. They don't breathe through their mouth. They don't, fit, they can't, they don't understand how to do it. The brain isn't wired that way. So if their nose is really plugged up, either from, from blood or a lot of mucus or, or congestion or something, uh, and they're struggling to breathe, if you just simply clear out their nasal uh, pharynx, either with a bulb syringe or, uh, you know, or your suction tube or something, and they can breathe through that, all of a sudden you've taken the stress off the kid. Even though it'd be like, well, why can't, Surely they can figure that out. No, they can't really figure that out. You have to help them with that. Uh, and C-spine immobilization uh, or stabilization, uh, you want to be concerned about that with any kid who's traumatized. And again, we talked about earlier that they may not have a fractured spine, but their, their uh, cervical spine may have been manipulated 
or moved in such a way during whatever this trauma was that it has uh, injured the spinal cord itself. So tracheal intubation. I know that here in New Mexico and a lot of other states around the country no longer uh, have pediatric intubation in the scope of care. Uh, but I want to touch. I wanted to touch upon that just a little bit because you may decide that I have a kid with a really bad airway, and my basic ways of taking care of that airway are not really adequate for this kiddo. And we've got a long transport, and so I want to go ahead and get an air medical crew here who has the special skills and the tools and the medications that will help them tracheally intubate this kid, uh, so that we're going to have a good way, a good airway for the rest of the trip. So, so this kid is not hypoxic any longer. Uh, and so basically. Why would you intubate a kid? Inability to oxygenate or ventilate, and prolonged transport time or extenuating circumstances. You may feel like this kid is starting to fatigue out. This is that asthmatic who you're now in your fourth or fifth albuterol neb treatment, and they're starting to fatigue out. And you know, within the next few minutes, they're probably going to stop breathing, and you're going to need to breathe for them. And uh, and maybe you don't have uh, you know a good airway to match them, or you've tried to use your king airway or something else, and it, you just didn't get a good fit and we're getting good chest rise and fall, uh, and, and the kid was not, the SATs were staying low. No. So now, you mentioned uh, five minutes of pre-oxygenation. Are you talking like on a non-rebreather or bagging the kid up for five minutes before you, you go in for the tube? I, I would say that if a child is breathing adequately on their own, uh, and you've got the pulse ox on, uh, that first try it with high flow nasal cannula, and then add to that your non-rebreather, uh, and, and if that gets the SATs up to say 94%, then let that be for the next five minutes. Uh, again, unless there's some other, this kid is bleeding out and I need to get going to the trauma center, well then maybe not the full five minutes, but you, you, you don't want it to like, let me just get there and then all of a sudden now start doing it because you, you want to have adequate pre-oxygenation so that the, when you're doing the intubation or the airway placement, that uh, the kid doesn't desaturate uh, very quickly on you. You may, um, if, again, if the kid is breathing adequately, but maybe you don't get good oxygen saturations with the high flow nasal cannula and the non rebreather. Take the non rebreather off, get your pediatric BDM, hold that with, with two hands, and there's some pictures in just a little bit. Hold that on there, and every time the child breathes, they will open the valve in the BDM, and if you put a um, uh, a peep valve on there, dial it up to like five to 10, then every time the child exhales, they will keep the alveoli open. And so that's a four man CPAP for a kid who's adequately breathing on their own. And if they start to fatigue out, I'm already in the position to now start assisting bagging them. One of the problems with doing a lot of bagging on the front end, if you don't need to, is it's not uncommon in this excited thing with this kid to over bag them. And you get a lot of air that not only goes into the lungs, it goes into the belly. You get a big, uh, a lot of air into the stomach, which presses up against the diaphragm, which prevents you from adequately ex expanding the lungs uh, because you've got that air that's kind of trapping it. So just a little bit more on this slide. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, trying to figure out what's the proper size ET tube for a kiddo. Uh, for uncuffed tubes, basically age four divided by four uh, plus four. So if I have a five-year-old, or let's say I have, yeah, let's say I have a five-year-old. Or actually, let's make the math easy. I have a four-year-old. Age of four divided by four, that's one, plus four is five. So I'm gonna use a five uncuffed tube. If I have a cuff tube, then I'm gonna, instead of plus four, it's gonna be plus 3.5. Now, and sometimes the cuff, uncuffed with no air in it, is enough to seal the airway. If it's not, if you've got a leak, then you go ahead and blow it up a little bit and see if that stops the leak. You don't need to put all that air in it uh, to really put a lot of pressure in that uh, balloon. And then for depth of insertion, basically, so I've got that five, uh, uncuffed tube, then the depth would be three times the five, so I would expect to have it about 15 uh, centimeters at the T for the kiddo. And then there's a few other things on a few other tubes that are in that. And then if you're taking care of the little bitty baby, because you went out there for the mom who was pregnant and she was pushing and you delivered a kid uh, out of the hospital or in the back of your ambulance, and the kid wasn't, wasn't responding well, not breathing well, and you needed to intubate the kid, again, I appreciate that. That's a special skill in New Mexico for the paramedics then you would use this to kind of figure out uh, what would be the proper size ET tube. And then the length for that one is simply what's the weight of the kid in kilos and then add six to that. So I've got a little, little bitty preemie that's two kilograms, two plus six is eight, I would expect the tube to be eight at the, uh, at the list.
that sort of thing guys. I just wanted to let you know we have 20 minutes left. Got it. All right, so other things, estragolic airways. And that's probably what the bulk of the paramedics in the state are going to be using. They, pretty much every estragolic airway that's out there comes in uh, pediatric sizes. Know what you're using, know how to properly place it, uh, and then uh, secure it carefully, obviously reassess frequently to make sure that it's still in the proper place and still properly uh, protecting your airway. If you needed to do a cryptothyrotomy, in kiddos basically less than 10 to 12 years of age or certainly less than 40 kilograms, you're gonna wanna do a needle versus surgical because when you get up, when you bring out that big O scalpel, and you're gonna be cutting that very narrow um, pediatric airway, it's too easy to potentially cut all the way through it or significantly through it that it would then tear the rest away around. And now you would have a totally loose trachea and the muscles in the neck are going to contract and they're gonna pull that trachea further down into the chest and now you've lost your, your total airway and now that's a dead kid. What a nightmare. Yes, big nightmare. Now, the nice thing about this though is it's really rare to have a kid who has a totally blocked airway. So usually you, you are able to ventilate and or oxygenate this kid in some fashion. This is also just uh, some information that says, if you have a kid that's less than five years of age, it would be better if you bag them. And in the pitch in the center, there's kind of a picture of how you can kind of do that. 14 gauge angiopath, and in this particular thing, three mil syringe with a seven ET tube, pull the plunger out, put a seven ET tube on that, and it all connects nice and well, and then you can be bagging the kid. Appreciating you're, gonna, you're not gonna get that big chest rise and fall, but you are gonna be getting oxygen to the kid. Now, they're not really gonna exhale very much, so you may have to periodically stop this and then slowly press on the child's chest for a little bit of exhalation, but all you're doing is buying time. And the child's not gonna die from oxygenation, or I'm sorry, they're not gonna die from the, uh, from the Increase in tidal CO2 that's building up, they're going to die from the oxygenation. So, this is a way to oxygenate the kid. If the kid's older than five, ideally, if you would jet insufflate. And so, that's the other picture on the right shows a jet insufflation where you've got the 14 gauge NGCAF is attached to the oxygen hose, and then there's a button that you press, and that's connected to your 50 psi port on your oxygen tank. And then you just press that, it's going to be a short press, and then you're not, you're not going to be bagging them like, you know, every three seconds. Bag 1001, 1002, bag 1001, 1002, because all you're doing is oxidating, there's not really exhalation, and so it's going to be a lot longer pause between how frequent you're bagging them or in the jet insulation that you're pushing the button. So, breathing, so we've taken care of the airway, now we're looking at breathing and ventilation. So, again, how well is the child breathing? Are accessory muscle use, uh, are they tripoding in that great position that you typically see the, the asthmatic kid? Uh, because it's easier for them to breathe when they're not lying down and having to use muscles to actually raise their chest up. Um, and so getting them in, in the right position, making sure that, uh, you know, if you are having to bag them, then appropriate volumes and pressures, uh, and appreciating that one hand on the bag, not two hands on the bag. Uh, you may need to put an OG tube down or an NG tube down if you have that capability. Uh, because you may, you may, or someone prior to may have been overbagging the patient, and you need to decompress the stomach. Uh, obviously, uh, pulse ox gives you an idea of how well you're oxygenating the kid, but appreciating that it's kind of there's a time delay. You know, so what you're seeing right now on the pulse ox is maybe one or two minutes old. So appreciate that if they're going down, and you're seeing 92, it's probably already at 90 actually for the kiddo. And then in total CO2 gives you an idea of how well you're ventilating. Also, just, just a, an aside, entitled CO2 also tells you about the perfusion. If I don't have enough perfusion to bring entitled CO2 back to the lungs to be off gas, I'm going to get a small entitled CO2. And all of us know that intuitively because when we're doing CPR on someone, just before we start getting pulses back, we will typically see a big jump in the entitled CO2 if we're, if we're watching for it, and that's because we're starting to have better perfusion. So look at it on the other side too. If you start seeing slow fall in entitled CO2 on a child that was doing pretty good, go feel for that child's pulse, especially in the trauma patient, and maybe uh, their blood pressure is getting weaker and weaker. So doing the BVM, this picture shows this is the best way to secure a mask, and that is one person doing nothing but securing the mask and a totally separate person doing the BVM. And I don't like the picture with respect that it's showing two hands on the bag. It's better to have one hand on the bag, even for the adult patient. 
because those bags are typically about a, a liter to 1500 uh, mLs in the bag. And as we all know, typically even in the adult, the volume that you want to be giving is somewhere between six to eight mils per kilo. And so six to eight mils per kilo. If I have a hundred kilo person, I want to give them about, you know, 600 to 800. That bag's a thousand to 1500. If I do that, I'm going to be over uh, pressurizing the lungs and potentially causing damage. And so you can easily do that on the kiddo. Um, so you may need to use that with an OPA uh, or an NPA. Uh, if the kid has a gag reflex, then you wouldn't use the OPA, you just use the NPA, and that just helps keep the tongue off a little bit better. So it really we're just talking about here. That's where you might do a little clicoid pressure to kind of prevent what, what it's supposed to do is to help prevent in your bagging some of the air going down into the esophagus. There has been some research that's been done, and it really turns out that subit maneuver doesn't really help that much. Uh, and it may create some, some problems for you. So you might not even need to mess with that at all. Circulation. So what's the LOC of the kid? If I don't have good perfusion, my brain's not perfusing, the LOC is down. Uh, what's my cap refill? And, and do that on the chest so it's kind of central. And so you can press on the chest and you see, and if that's delayed, okay, I really need to give this kid some fluids. Uh, what's the heart rate? Yeah, fast heart rates frequently. That's how a pediatric responds to poor perfusion. Uh, way before you would ever see a drop in a blood pressure. They may lose 30 to 40 percent of their of their blood volume before you actually see a drop in their blood pressure because their heart is so good it's heating up and, and accommodating. Pulses, where can you feel the pulses? Uh, can you only feel, can you feel them distally or do you have to go brachially or do you have to go all the way up to parotid? That's telling you I have poor perfusion. And what's the skin look like and what's this, is it pale? Meaning I don't have enough pink blood in the tissue to keep them pink. Uh, or, and, and is, the, is the skin damp or is it cold? Again, uh, if, if, if I have warm blood in my skin or in, in my extremities, then my extremity is gonna be pink and my extremity is gonna be warm. If I don't have that because it's shunting, then the skin's gonna be a good thing to tell you what's going on. Uh, control the hemorrhage, obviously any obvious things that you can see, uh, and certainly establish IV or IO access. You know, I think the standard is if you can't get a, if a kid really needs an IV and you can't get an IV within 90 seconds, then go to the IO. Most people are using the uh, easy IO uh, uh, because it, it's such a wonderful device uh, and, and it gets your uh, IV access really quick. And if you have a critical kid, uh, you always want two IVs. So if you're having to drill, then you're gonna drill twice. And then fluid resuscitation typically in a kiddo is gonna be two mils per kilo. Bolus, reassess the kid and then see if they need another bolus. If you happen to be able to give blood or if you're picking up the kid and the kid is getting blood or, or you have blood to be able to give them boluses, then you would, you would tend to uh, give that at 10 mils per kilo. People's disability, pupils, are they reactive, are they not? Are they slow, are they fast? Uh, uh, can the kid follow your movement with, with your uh, light pen or something? Now, some people, it's interesting, you know, I'll be talking to you and you're totally alert and oriented and I'll bring out the pen light. I don't need the pen light on someone who's totally alert and oriented. I need the pen light on somebody who's altered. Uh, and if it's outside, my pen light is not gonna beat the sun for how small your pupils are. So in that case, what I actually need to do is create shade to see if your pupils dilate. So I gotta do it the reverse way to see if they actually move. How's the kid responding to their parents? How do they respond to you? Uh, pediatric GCS, I'll show that in just a minute. And don't forget, check hypoglycemia because that may be why the kid is altered it has nothing to do with the trauma. It has to do with the fact that, oh, their blood sugar is low. Because kiddos have a higher metabolism, so they're gonna burn through their blood sugar a lot quicker than adults are, so it's easier, quicker for them to become hypoglycemic. There's your pediatric Glasgow coma scale. Uh, there's some slight differences in the verbal part and the motor part. So just have that on you, uh, whether it's a cheat card or it's on your Braslow tape or what, whatever weight-based tape you have, or it's on your uh, app on your phone to just help you uh, remember what's the proper GCS for a, uh, for a kiddo. Expose, environment exposed, look for the injury. So that means, now, you typically don't need to totally expose any of your patients. So, and especially in kids, we already talked about they can get hypothermic very easy. So expose the part. Once you see if there's any injuries there, cover that back up. Expose another part, cover that back up. Expose another part, cover that back up. In this particular case, sadly, they've got this kid totally uh, exposed in the uh, OR and uh, this particular and, and appreciate that when you're taking care of some kids depending upon 
especially teenagers, they're going to be a little more fearful about being exposed or being a little more modest. And so you have to really pay attention to that. Who is a strange person who's just come here in this ambulance or this helicopter or this plane? And why are they taking my clothes off? What the heck's going on? Uh, so uh, explaining things to them. And again, being cautious about that and how many people are in that room. Uh, and then certainly, again, prevent hypothermia. This particular kid fell onto rebar. It went in uh, just uh, medial to his knee, came out his thigh, went in subcostal into his right chest and just up to his scapula. And um, so they, uh, he, he, obviously there's a hole in his diaphragm that went from his abdomen up to his, up his thorax. Uh, one little small injury, uh, they then uh, removed that, gave him antibiotics, IV fluids, whatever. He was just started 72 hours later. He was fine. Wow. Yeah. So despite how bad some things look, sometimes they're actually pretty good. So getting into that secondary assessment, and this is showing, don't forget to look at the back. You may miss some injury there. Uh, whether you're sweeping with your hands and then bringing them out to see if there's any fluids on them, or you're doing a log row to take a good fit and to pull some other things uh, off of the kid up. Getting that history, what happened, what's the medical history of this kid. Most kids, you know, when they're young and they come onto the planet, they come on pretty healthy. And usually when you're checking a history, if they have a medical history, it's usually one of three things. They have seizures, they have their diabetes, or they're asthmatic. And then usually they have the meds for those things. And that's usually it. They're typically not allergic to any medicines because they haven't had enough weird things happen that they've had to go to hospitals to get weird medications that they didn't demonstrate an allergy to. So you're pretty safe in that sense. Uh, vital signs, again, remember that the uh, blood pressure is probably going to stay good for the longest period of time. So you're really looking at um, GCS, respiratory rate, heart rate, skin signs, etc. cetera. Uh, what are the interventions that you've done? What are the, how have they responded to those? Did they get better? Did they get worse? Did they stay the same? Do you need to do some more? Head trauma. Number one cause of death, anatomical differences. We already talked about they have a larger head, so it's easier for them to fall over. They have, the really young ones have open cranial sutures. So because of that, it's not, a, it's not an enclosed box. This is the one patient that if they have a head bleed, and I mean a traumatic brain injury, not a scalp bleed, that they could actually lose enough blood in their head, in their skull, that they could actually become hypotensive because of that amount of loss. In an adult, you can't bleed enough into your head to have that. It's got to be external. They're less myelinated, and so that, uh, that means that the brain is much more fragile uh, to, uh, to any injuries. Secondary brain injury causes because we didn't keep them well perfused and we didn't keep them oxygenated. They may have seizures. If they have a seizure, give your benzo benzos of your choice, whatever you like. Uh, and then uh, for maintenance, typically phosphenatoin is given at the hospitals. Sometimes they consider maybe giving a prophylactic therapy if they have a head injury, but even if they haven't had a seizure, there's controversy back and forth on do you do that, do you not do that. Spinal cord injuries, we kind of talked about that. This particular x-ray is an adult because you're going to actually see the one, they got a lot of cavities that they've taken care of with metal fillings <laughs> in there. Two, uh, there's actually a fracture there which would, would impinge upon this patient's spinal cord and create the thing. In the kiddos, you tend to have sawara or scawara, however you want to pronounce that, spinal cord injury without radiological abnormalities. So you take the x-ray, you, you take the CT, and it's, it's a kid who can't feel uh, you know, the lower half of his body or can't move the lower half of his body, but yet when you take the x-ray or take the CT, you don't see any physical injury so then they would do an MRI, and in the MRI, because now you're looking at tissue, then they might see the underperfused part of the spinal cord that is edematous or has decreased blood flow to that part, uh, and maybe is already ischemic. Number two cause of death, thoracic injuries. Multiple trauma, shooting, stabbings, uh, uh, fractured ribs, contused lungs, contused heart, maybe a pneumothorax. Uh, and you would treat the pneumothorax like you would in the adult. You know, figure out which side is it on, and you, you would typically needle the chest. Um, in, in your larger kids, if, they, if they're fluffy, as it were, they have a lot of ex excess tissue, uh, you may find that your needle was not long enough, so then you might want to go uh, under the, under the uh, armpit in like the fourth or fifth intercostal space, where you're above where, the, uh, where your chest muscles and your back muscles come together, and so it's a, lot, it's a thinner area for you to punch through. Abdominal injuries, they don't have near as much musculature of their abdomen, and so it's less protected, so it's much easier for them to have abdominal injuries. 
uh, you know, assessing like you normally would. I'm looking first. Uh, I'm noting any bruises or wounds or anything, uh, and then I and then I I rarely listen to an ad wound because a lot of times it doesn't really tell you anything whether I have no sounds, hyperactive sounds, or minimal sounds. You can have all of those and still have an injury, so it really doesn't tell you that much. Uh, so you would tend to look and then you would gently feel, uh, and I would say stay away from where the obvious injury is first and try to check that because if you go straight for where the primary wound is, then everywhere else you touch in on the other, it's going to hurt because you've already hurt the one place. Uh, and then fast and, and uh, CT scans are the fastest with the ultrasound or CT scans and helps get further information as to what truly is injured or if there's actually free fluid in the belly. And if it's a trauma patient, free fluid is uh, believed to be blood until proven different. Management, if you had this kiddo here, you know, you want to have some uh, wet uh, saline gauzes. And then I would, put, I would put saran wrap or plastic wrap around it or, or some of your uh, sterile wrapping that your dressing came in and put that over that because you want to keep it moist and warm because they can really lose a lot of body heat with this, with this exposure right here. Lab belt injury, there's that lab belt injury I talked about earlier. So if you see that, really be concerned that maybe I don't feel it now, maybe the belly feel, still feels soft, it's not distended yet, it's not uh, firm, they're not guarding. Uh, but think about that you've got some sort of abdominal injury and that you may also have a lumbar uh, fracture with this. Musculoskeletal injuries. Oh, that came out kind of weird looking. Muscle etel injury. So you gotta, you gotta create your splints. If you only have adult splints and you gotta figure out how much more padding do I need about the, uh, around this so that I can actually immobilize this pediatric uh, broken arm in this particular case. Uh, there may be some commercial devices, but a lot of us don't carry adult and ped sized devices. It's a little hard to do that. So you've got other things, uh, towels, tongue blades, magazine, uh, and then be a good bartender for your patients. Uh, pain management. Um, I, I like fentanyl. I like Versed. They both can be given intranasally. And so I might have the 12-year-old uh, girl who's got a fractured femur because she fell off her bike. And uh, I squirt up her nose a little fentanyl and a little Versed, get her a little more comfortable. Then I might start the IV. Then I might give her some more. Then I might finally straighten up that leg with a fractured spot. And that way I'm, I'm just, you know, you're being very comfortable for your kiddos. Uh, and the parents really like that too, and they see their kids not screaming as you're uh, trying to t trying to relocate this. Because like this this kid right here, if you splinted that in the position found, you probably can't get that kid into your ambulance or helicopter or airplane. You're going to have to get it into a more anatomically normal aligned position. One is more comfortable. You you have a better chance that you have good blood flow and good nerve conduction when it's in a more anatomical position then splinting it the way you find it. Secure the patient appropriately. Don't just put them on the big stretcher. Have those other smaller things. These are two different commercial devices uh, that you're using so that you've got the kid properly secured there. Uh, being put in the patient in the parent's arm is not adequate securing. If some wreck happens during the transport, that kid's gonna come flying out of the parent's arms and now you've got increased injury uh, to the kiddo and you certainly don't want that to happen. Here's a scenario. All right, here we go, real quick. Six-year-old riding a bike, swerved in traffic, struck by the car. 45 minutes from where the kid is to the pediatric trauma center. You decide, you know what, let's go ahead and because of what I'm assessing of this kid, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call for the helicopter to come. And so the helicopter gets that information and we're making sure, are we operationally safe? Is the helicopter good to go? Do we have proper weather that we can see adequately out there? Uh, is the aircraft good to go? Is our equipment good to go? Are we good to go? And all of that is okay. So safe LZs, secured zone by the, e by the first responders, EMS fire department. And uh, so we go over and the patient's in the ambulance and they tell us that when they got to the scene, they found the patient supine with a pillow under his head, covered with a blanket. There was a large amount of emesis on the blanket and they placed him in spinal motion restriction. So some bystander who saw this happen was kind enough to come over and do that. Ideally, you might have liked the fact that maybe you shouldn't have put the pillow under your head because if they have a spinal cord injury, I'm a little concerned, but that's what they did. You know, no harm, no foul, good Samaritan. On exam, the kid's awake, says he can't feel his legs. His respiration is also labored. He's using accessory muscles to breathe, and priapism is present. What's priapism? It means his penis is hard and it's sticking up. Why is his penis hard and sticking up? Well, because he has a spinal cord injury and the problem is he no longer has the nerve conduction 
to his penis to cause it to, to the blood to flow in and out. And all you've got is the blood flowing in and he's got a vasoconstriction on the blood flowing out. Over time, many, many minutes to several hours, that sphincter will finally relax and the penis will become soft again. This is a bad sign for this kid. Also the fact that he can't feel his legs. Here's his blood pressure, 74 systolic. And this was a six year old. We know the lowest blood pressure that we ought to accept in a, in a, in a kid is 70 plus two times their age. Two times six is 12, plus 70 is 82. He's already hypotensive, okay? And his heart rate's only 88. You would expect it to be fast. That's further evidence that this is a neurologic injury. So this is neurological shock, which is different than the other shocks. The hemorrhagic shocks, they would tend to have a low blood pressure and a rapid pulse. And their skin would tend to be pale, cool, and damp. But this one, because they vasodilated, because he doesn't have control of the sympathetic nervous system anymore, He's pink, warm, and dry with a low blood pressure and a slow heart rate. He's way behind the curve because his body can't respond to this. So we really have to jump on this and start our fluids and give him, give him fluids uh, to fill the tank, as it were, because he's vasodilated out. Uh, hasn't necessarily lost blood internally. He's just, his, blood, his blood vessels have dilated out. Also breathing at a fast rate, and his stats are fine at this point. So we figure out how to get an IV access, and the parents are on the scene, so they'll let them know what's going on. And we're gonna tell them, you know, here's where we're gonna take them. Uh, so if one has to stay behind and get take care of because there's other kids or something, then they also know where you're gonna be taking this particular child to. Especially if you can't take the parents with you. But if you can't take the parents, please take at least one with you. Signs and symptoms of respiratory stress in kids, we kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, you know, fast heart rate, accessory muscle use, tugging or nasal flaring, uh, uh, and what are you going to do for his airway? Well, right now he's protecting his airway, but we have a lot of emphasis, emphasis on the blanket. So I may be concerned that he's going to throw up again and, and obstruct his airway. Now, depending upon how I can transport him in, in my vehicle, I may be able to simply, if he starts throwing up again, turn him, protecting his spine, and let gravity help in suction. But if you feel like you need to take care of the airway, then for a kid who's awake like this and talking to us, I'm going to have to do something to get them compliant with me to get there, whether that's my RSI medications, you know, to include a neuromuscular blocker. So, Jim, when I think RSI, just broadly, I'm thinking like rock or socks. Do you have a preference in this situation? Well, I, I tend to use uh, rock uranium for the bulk of my patients. But if, if you don't have rock uranium or you've got the choice, rock or socks, I would tend to use rock uranium on, the, on your younger pediatric patients than succinylcholine and maybe, you, and maybe reserve the socks to like the six or older. And the reason for that is there are some children who have neuromuscular diseases that they haven't, they're not old enough yet for a parent or a doctor to have assessed them and to realize, oh, they're not moving quite normally or they're not acting quite normally. Let's assess them to see if they have a neuromuscular disease. And if you give that kid succinylcholine, you will exacerbate their neuromuscular disease, whereas rock uranium won't. So if you carry both, reserve the rock for the, younger, the youngest ones, you know, three, four, five years of age, and then you can use either rock or sucks for the older kids. And I want to just take a moment here. We um, are at eight o'clock, but I really um, am appreciating the information that's being shared. So I would like to ask our viewers and our Facebook friends if they can just hang on with us a little bit as we go through these last few slides. Um, probably another 15, 20 minutes. Oh, not even, not even not that. Even we're that. almost done with this scenario. So we're almost done with the scenario, and then we'll have some questions and answers after that. But I, I think I'd like to continue if you're okay with that. Sure. Okay. Works for me. All right. And so how are you going to obtain vascular access? We talked about, you know, where, where can you find IV access on this six-year-old kid? Uh, is it in the uh, AC or is it in the forum? It'd be nice sometimes if you stay away from the AC because it's not uncommon that patients will at some point, you know, bend their arm and then it, it affects the blood flow of the fluid. Whereas if you can do it on the forearm, then they can bend this and, and you still have fairly decent flow because you're not also bending the catheter. Uh, but, you know, if the AC is all you have, the AC is all you have, better something than nothing. And if you can't get an ID, then we're going to be using the interosseous. And you have various access points for that interosseous. Uh, a lot of patients are, or a lot of times you're going to be using that in the proximal uh, tibial area. Uh, some might even do the distal tibia area, which is going to be in the medial malleolus or basically on the medial side of your ankle. Uh, and if it's the much older kid, you potentially then could use the humeral heads.
in route, the patient becomes very hypotensive with a heart rate in the 50s. So, signs and symptoms of spinal shock. Some people get these two confused. Spinal shock is all about the fact that I can't feel or I can't move. That, in essence, is spinal shock. And sometimes that will get a little bit better as, the, uh, as you get the patient better perfused, better oxygenated, and, and as the edema and swelling goes down in the spinal cord, they may actually regain some function back. Neuroshock is the problem where, uh, where my spinal cord has been injured, I've also injured my sympathetic nervous system, which kind of runs parallel to that in our, in our primarily in our uh, thoracic spinal area. And so I've cut off my sympathetic stimulation, and that's why I don't have the fast heart rate. That's why I have the uh, uh, vasodilated blood, blood vessels, and that's why I'm still warm, pink, and dry as opposed to pale, cool, and diaphoretic, and that's why my heart rate is not up, uh, but my blood pressure sucks. Uh, so treatment for that is basically fluids, fluids, fluids to fill them up, and once I feel like I've given enough fluids uh, for them, and that's kind of a, your assessment of your kiddo, your assessment of the situation, then you might actually think for vasopressors, which is really rare in a trauma patient. Normally we think of vasopressors in a non-trauma patient, but in this particular case, that's what I need, because I need something to squeeze those blood vessels back down to their normal size so I have good, uh, uh, good perfusion. And so that could be in a kiddo. Dopamine tends to be one that you, that you see a lot in kiddos. In, in older kids or adults, you might see levofed. Uh, dopamine does, will do two things for you. Dopamine can help increase the heart rate, increase the heart contraction, and also increase the vasoconstriction. So it's kind of combating a whole bunch of stuff going on with, uh, with this kiddo. What complications might you expect with neuroshock? You know, we've kind of covered them all uh, in the topic here and how to deal with the parents. You know, again, letting them know what's going on. Don't let something be a surprise. Don't keep things hidden from them. Let them know what's going on. Uh, even if that's okay, you know, mom, dad, you know, I think your child has a spinal cord injury. That's why we've got this, this thing going on. And here's what we're doing to take care of it. So key points, pay particular attention to your ET or extraglottic airway placement so it's always in place. You want to, every time you move a kid, you always want to check that if, if that's what you've got in place. Weight-based fluid administration we talked about for uh, crystalloids and that would be normal saline and lactating ringers. Uh, 20 mils per kilo uh, bolus and then reassess your kid and see you know, how they're doing with that. You may need to do that two or three or even four times. At some point though, especially if you're at a sending facility, they're gonna be moving over to uh, red blood cells. Uh, especially if this is trauma and, and the kid has lost a lot of fluid. So then they're going to get 10 mils per kilo. Uh, they may also give some other blood products depending on the situation. Appropriate size equipment. Um, uh, and if you don't carry, how can you modify your adult size to work for the kiddo? Uh, proper securing inside your uh, ambulance. Uh, transporting to the pediatric uh, tertiary care centers. And, and again, in New Mexico, the only level one trauma center with pediatric capability is UNMH. Uh, but again, you may need to temporarily or, or a moment, you know, temporarily take them to your local hospital and then they may can make an arrangement. They may do some stabilization and then you continue on in your ground ambulance or uh, they may then call for an intermedical crew to come take that. Uh, think about maltreatment, especially if the injury pattern doesn't match what you're being told or if the story keeps changing every time you ask about it. And don't forget to check for hypoglycemia on your altered uh, trauma patients because you really don't want to get them all the way to the hospital and they check a blood sugar and it's like 20 and they give the kid some uh, glucose and the kid wakes up and he's like, oh, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> so there we are. So thank you, Jim. That sure. was amazing. I really did appreciate all of the information you shared with us. Um, it brought up some uh, questions for me uh, that I just have a couple of things that I, I wanna ask about. And then do we have any in our chat box? No, only well, our chat box. Right oh, now. I can but, look at that actually. But on Facebook, we just had a question about where they can see this later. So that is going to be great. We will be trying to put it into a video format as quickly as possible. And for those video formats, there are no CEs at this time, um, but we will put that onto YouTube. And so if you will just keep a look out on our Child Ready webpage, which is www.child-ready.org, we will put that in archive status within three to four weeks. It takes us just a little while to get that production part done. 
Um, one thing that I just want to bring up for our rural providers, um, really, all of these things are going to occur far away from all the medical treatments. So being up to date on your pediatric skills and equipment, how important is that? Well, it's, it's very important. And, and sadly, the farther away you get from a metropolitan area, the, the fewer opportunities they are for you to keep up with that. And so um, getting some of these air medical partners around the state will be more than happy to come out to you and to provide some of that if you're having trouble locally uh, to do that. They will either drive out or maybe they'll fly out for, for the day to provide, whether it's a one hour or two hour thing or an actual PALS course or something. Um, but you know, there, uh, you mentioned YouTube. There are so many good training videos now on YouTube. You know, when YouTube first came out, it was all about funny things, funny videos. And now there are so many medical schools and, and uh, instructors and stuff that use that. Uh, and, and there's some great training with that. Uh, there's great uh, pediatric resources, uh, whether it's uh, books or, uh, or uh, other questions. Or, and you can also Google you know, PowerPoint presentations on pediatric issues that, that, uh, have, an, uh, that have an interest for a particular person, with maybe with a particular type of kid, whether it's the asthmatic kid, and go find that. And, and so those are other ways that you can do that without having to come to a metropolitan area where you can kind of keep up with that. With that in mind, we um, at the New Mexico EMS for Children program, uh, we are going to be looking at developing some more um, hands-on skills at some of our regional and local conferences. So if your service is interested in maybe sending a trainer to be a train the trainer type is what we're envisioning this process to be, um, use the website uh, on there, the HSC, I'm sorry, the email address, the HSC, I've been child ready at salu.unm.edu and let me know or send me an email through Facebook um, because we'd like to get them, our, our smaller services, our volunteer services involved right from the beginning so we can make sure that we're reaching as many of our communities as possible. Um, Scott, any follow-up questions no, for you? Excellent. Who is that one under more? Is a... oh, one more, wait, there's something under there that's new. Uh, can we get a copy of the PowerPoint to share with our stations? As far as I'm concerned, you give you send me your. Uh, I'm gonna give you my email address, and I will send it to you as a uh, as a PDF, because it's a lot easier to send emails as a PDF than a larger PowerPoint. So my email is uh, J A L L Delta D is in Delta A Y, not actually Delta. Don't mess you up there. J A L L D A Y J A L L D A Y at salud.unm.edu. So first initial, last name, so Jim Alday, so J Alday at salud.unm.edu. Right, and you send it to me, I'm more than happy to send it to you. Uh, Lifeguard is part of UNMH. UNMH is a taxpayer supported hospital. Lifeguard is a taxpayer supported service. As far as we're concerned, all of our stuff is open to anybody. Yep, there you go, I, I figured out I was the one in charge of that. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. And again, that wraps it up for this evening. We thank you very much. Sure. This was excellent. And I certainly learned so much this evening. So we may invite you back to do this again in a few months. And uh, we'll talk about your neonatal transports or we'll talk about there's so many possibilities here. Um, so again, we appreciate your time. Scott, thank you. I know we spent many hours together earlier in the day here and thanks for coming back this evening and sharing your time ladies and gentlemen here and in the audience um please be safe take care of yourselves take care of your patients we appreciate you godspeed bye